I do have a little praise report for you. You know, uh, the oncologist told told us that uh, Dad's bone marrow had ceased to produce blood cells, red, white. So we put him on this this uh, medication and was giving him treat. The oncologist the other day. We went back to the doctor, and the oncologist told us that this would be a permanent condition and that, you know, Dad would be on this medication for the rest of his life. They drew more blood, and we got the results back. Dad's bone marrow is producing blood cells. I thank God for that. And I told the Lord, I said, I'm not going to be stingy, and I'm not I'm going to pray that you heal him if that's not your will. I just want your will. So evidently, God's decided to show the doctor that he don't know everything. So dad's still very weak, still has a lot of problems, still needs a lot of prayer. But God is doing a work, and we thank him for that. All right. Feast of, of I can't hardly pronounce these words either, brother. Feast of Purim. Purim. Now, in an article, there was 10 traits of courageous leaderships that was written by um, uh, a Susan uh, Terdankio, uh, discussed in uh, a 2011 and 12 Kesik study that recorded workplace stress was the highest level since the economic meltdown of 2008. Uh, most surprisingly about this study uh, was that the leading cause of this stress was fear. What, are we, what, what is it we don't have? God did what? He did not give us a spirit of fear. But Terdanko went ahead and wrote the rampant fear that has spread through many organizations, you know, organizational uh, cultures uh, into the, uh, forced many, orga, I'm sorry, organizational cultures into a, a downward spiral. The, the, uh, the, the state of the economy has created an untold level of, exi of, of anxiety. And in these situations, people tend to keep their heads down and their mouths shut in order to survive. But not only that not only applies to the rank and file, but it also applies to management as well. Jordanko says that she sees this as a time for renewal in courageous leadership in the workplace and offers the following profile of 10 key characteristics of courageous leadership. One, it is confronting reality head on. Two, seeking feedback and listen. Three, say what needs to be said. Aren't you glad that sometimes people just say to you what needs to be said? Listen, I'd rather you, I'd rather you take a chance on offending me and me go to heaven than to me not be offended and take a chance on going to hell. It's quiet in here today. Take action on performance issues. Communicate openly and frequently. Lead change. Make decisions and move forward. Give credit to others and hold people accountable. That last one folks usually don't like too much. Um, we often find ourselves prepared to, to be courageous in one or two areas of our life, defending our family and standing up for our political rights and views. Well, but we falter in other areas where courage is just as, just as vital. Uh, Susan Trinenko's top 10 remind us of the importance of courage, of courage as a virtue when it comes to all aspects of a victorious Christian life. We must be courageous. Uh, in Hebrews 11 and 1, and I will tell you, it is my fault that they don't have these scriptures. Uh, I got home last night, relaxed for a little bit, and I fell asleep, and I didn't get my scripture to them. So the old-fashioned way, unless they beat you to it. Hebrews 11 and 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Faith demands no sensory reinforcement. Doesn't need any of our sensory perceptions to to. Uh, to be used. Uh, it believes when it cannot see. 
and it trusts when it cannot understand. You see, we can't see it, we can't touch it, we can't smell it, and we can't taste it. That doesn't mean it's not there. It's still there. Some people may not understand why they are going through the things that they are going through. And they may even start to lose faith. But that is the time when we need to hold on to faith even harder than we did before. You may not understand why you're going through what you're going through. You may not understand why things didn't turn out the way you thought they did. Hang on to your faith. Don't let go. Don't let go. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5 and 7 says, For we walk by faith, not by sight. Not by sight. All right, so in one short verse, Paul captures both the triumph and the trial of walking with Christ. Walking by faith is one skill that we always are learning and we never master. I don't know, some folks may have, but I have not mastered it. I was thinking about that earlier this morning when I got up and it dawned on me that Enoch was probably one person that I could think about that maybe mastered faith. Because the Bible said that he would walk with God and was not. Okay, come on, was not. Or why? God took him. God took him. Today, uh, we will look at a lesser known feast. How many ever heard the feast? Heard about the feast of, of Purim? Anybody remember that? Wow. Okay. I didn't either. <laughs> well, let, we're going to learn about uh, somewhat about this lesser feast uh, that is surprisingly connected to one of the better known Old Testament stories of Queen Esther. It gave birth to Jewish history to commemorate the Feast of Purim, which remains one of the most popular Jewish feasts today, given its entertaining and almost comedic tone. It is easily for contemporary readers to gloss over the important theology truths that are contained in this story of Esther. The story of Esther and the Feast of Purim are together a celebration of divine providence and human courage. Divine providence is um, it, it, it means this, that all that occurs in the universe takes place under divine providence, which is under God's strategy and strategic guidance and control. God is in control. And, of course, the ever-living adventure of living by faith, of walking by faith. All right. The return of exile stands uh, as, as essentially uh, the final divine act of the, of the national salvation recorded uh, in the Old Testament. Alongside the history of, of Israel, in 539, I'm going to give you a little bit of history before we get into uh, Esther and them, if you don't mind. In uh, 539 B.C., Cyrus, king of Persia, issued a decree allowing the Jews to return to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple of, uh, temple of the Lord. After they had gone into captivity following the fall of Jerusalem to Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar in 586 B.C. It is important to note that Ezra narrated this event in terms similar to Israel's uh, original exodus from Egypt when it said, and the children of Israel borrowed from the Egyptians jewels of silver, jewels of gold, and remnant. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they lent unto them such things as they required, and they spoiled Egypt. Well, Ezra noted, all they, all they that were about them, mm, all they that were about them, strengthened their hands with vessels of silver, with gold, with goods, with beasts, and with precious things, besides all that was willingly offered. In both incidences, Israel and the Persians were people that were sworn enemies of Egypt, of Egypt, of Israel. Though it came not through spectacular plagues and dividing of the seas, but through the, the, the 
actions of a king to release them. That's how this happened. So, you know, the original exodus of, of, of Israel from Egypt was much more spectacular than, than this one. All right. One, one other important element to note in Cyrus's decree is that it allowed but did not require all Jews to return to Jerusalem. In surprising reality of the return is not how many Jews undertook the arduous journey back to their ancient homeland, but the majority of exiles that chose to stay. That chose to stay. Um, now, the purpose, now understand that that they became exiled because of Nebuchadnezzar when he overthrew uh, Judah and took captive all of the people there. Uh, he focused on the young men, the young upper class men, the intelligent, the, the ones that, that, as he said, the purpose of Nebuchadnezzar's order to train the young man. Remember when he took captive him and Daniel was one of them, he wanted to train them in the, in the language of the Chaldeans. And uh, his attempt to take the up-and-coming generation of Judean leaders and make them into model Babylonians. That's what his, that's what his desire was. Not only should such an action uh, destroy the future of the Judean residents, but it would absorb them into the Babylonian way of life. But it would... <coughs> I'm sorry. But it would... Uh, it would fill the, the uh, Babylonian positions in political positions. All of the young and intelligent uh, Israelites would end up being part of the up-and-coming generation in, ba in Babylonia, especially in their, in their politics. He was hoping that he would have a pool of very intelligent young men that he could draw from. Now, when, Bab when, when Babylon was quietly conquered by the Persian Empire, it seems that many of the Jewish bureaucrats remained in positions because of, and become mid-level administrators in the complex uh, Persian political system. Thus, by the time that, that, Cyrus, that Cyrus' decree was issued, many of the exiles had sufficient ties to the land and to the positions and that they held, and they viewed the trip back to their homeland as one of, of not so attractive and not so appealing to them. And it seemed that many of the exiles had lost their longing for home. Think about that for a minute. We should never lose the part of us that longs for home. We should never be so content in this world that the thought of the rapture is, hmm, I have so much more I'd rather do. The young people used to said to me once, we was talking about the rapture, they said, but Brother Lucas, we really don't want the rapture to come yet. We got so much stuff that we want to do. I said, well, you really don't have a choice in that. But you need to look at what you're saying. You want to stay here and not go to heaven? Oh, no, 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 no. We want to go to heaven. We just want the Lord to wait a little while. But we, as Christians, as, as, as apostolic, Holy Ghost-filled people, should not ever get to the place where we're kind of too relaxed being here. We need to remember that we are just exiles, that we are, that we are in a foreign land. And that God has a plan for us. And for us not to forget that this world is not our home. That song was on my mind this morning. This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. Da-da-da-da-da-da. Somewhere beyond the blue. That's how I remember the song. Sorry about that. You should have you should have been up to the old Bible church when I led song service. Oh, Lord Jesus. I'm so thankful for Sister Lee and you every word. All right, now understand that now we're going to get into the story of Mordecai and Esther now. 
The story of Esther is a story of favor in a foreign land. A story of surprising rivals of seemingly impossible circumstances. Surprisingly finding themselves in impossible circumstances. The king had banished his queen, Vestai, set the stage for Esther's appearance. A couple of things are important to keep in mind as we follow the story. First, the Persian king was impulsive, and he was just a little inept. And I wondered about that when I first read it, but as I studied a little bit more, yeah, he, he really was. This, this, this lack of kingly character serves as a foil of him and the courage that comes to Mordecai and Esther. Second, unlike the whimsical king, Persian law was unretractable. Once a king had made a decree, it could never be reserved or reversed. These details played critical roles in this story. His advisors put together a plan to eventually confiscate all the beautiful women of the kingdom for the king's harem. Now, there's no indication in the scriptures that this was a voluntary thing. We're just going to come take them. You got a good looking daughter, and we think she's good looking. We're just going to come take her. And we're going to take her to a place where she can be in a harem for the king. That's just what I would want to hear as a father. But what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Thus, it is, it, thus it is more likely that Esther and the other young women were removed against their will. Esther's appointment as the next queen of Persia must have been mixed a mixed bag of emotions, along with all. Can you imagine, imagine going from where you're at to being a king or a queen. All of the pampering, all of the luxury. My my grandmother used to say that she believed that Queen Elizabeth didn't even wash her own face. I thought, well, Mom, that would be disgusting. I don't want nobody to come in and wash my face. I don't like it when you spit on something and wash my face. <laughs> I laugh. You know your mother did it too, Brother Eddie. There was sure, there was times that, that of many moments of homesickness and heartbreak. It is impossible to see the element of tragedy here for us to understand the depth of the character required for Esther and Mordecai to follow their actions. It was mixed emotions, I'm sure, for Esther, but it also turned into absolute horror. When Haman conceived a dastardly plan against the Jews, all because Mordecai refused to bow to Haman. Haman's wrath cost him to devise a plot to eliminate all of the Jews in the kingdom. Remember in Bible study a few weeks ago, Brother Julian was speaking, and he was talking about three things that you should never let happen to you. Anybody remember what they are besides pastor and me? What's one? Three things that will get you in trouble. Money? Huh? Your mouth? <laughs> you did for me, sister. Power. Mordecai had a lot of power. Not Mordecai. Not Mordecai. Haman had a lot of power. And if you didn't bow down when Haman come around, oh, look out. You're going to pay the price. Mordecai refused to bow. And Haman's hatred for the Jews built. So, understand, he proposed 
his plan to the king. But he didn't name the people that he wanted to eliminate. And the king approved Haman's plan. That's one thing that struck me when I was reading this, is, okay, this kind of shows me that he's not very kingly. Before you start eliminating people, Lord of mercy, you kind of want to know who you're eliminating, don't you? Of course, he was a king. He didn't get voted in. Today, they wouldn't do that unless they knew. How'd they vote last night? Come on, guys, that's supposed to be funny. So, okay, Haman called, now, now Haman called in the king's scribes, dictated a letter to be sent to all providences in the kingdom with instructions to destroy and kill all Jews, both young, old, little children, women. Kill them all. Kill them all. And do it in one day upon the 13th day of the month. Now get this. Although the decree, it was decreed by Haman, or I'm sorry, dicta- the letter was dictated by Haman, the letters were written in the name of the king. And it was even sealed with the king's ring. He really is losing a lot of stature here, isn't he? I mean, he's doing all this, and, and the word to, word to Ringo was on the king's finger. He's stamping stuff. He don't even know what he's stamping. Now, since Persian decree is irreversible, total destruction seemed to be intimate and unavoidable. Haman's actions and his hatred for the Jews, believe it or not, is not surprising. You realize he's a de- he was a descendant of the Amalekite king Ag- Agai? Agai? This is the man that King Saul spared in battle, disobeying God's command to utterly destroy the Amalekites. And the, and the first battle that the Israelis fought was with the people, was what? The Amalekites, on their way to Sinai. The very first battle as a people that they fought was against them. Was against them. In other words, Haman was the last known descendant of Israel's oldest enemy. His oldest enemy. Understand that disobeying the commands of God always seems to come back at you. Disobeying God, I'm sorry, obeying God is the only way of staying out of trouble. I used to think I'd gotten by with stuff. No. I'd get that paddle. You'd come. David Lucas, get in here. Man, I thought I was... Got by. No. My grandmother got me. And I got... I got up for stuff my brother did too, believe it or not. Honestly, I did. She'd say no. All right, after Mordecai heard the king's decree, he sent word to Esther to appeal to the king, making this request. Now, making this request took great courage, risk exposing the real relationship to Esther and her ethnicity. Esther replied, revealed that she was a little uneasy about this. She was in a very precarious situation that the king had not called her for, over a, for about a month. Now, if you had not talked, Brother Vaughn, if Sister Vaughn had not talked to you for a month, would you think that you just maybe you might be in some trouble? Somebody's got to agree with me. Brother, no, I'm not even going to ask him. Understand that she felt like she hadn't been called before the king for like 30 days, that this could be a sign of his disfavor towards her. Oh, my, and you want me to go before the king with this, with, with this, with this? If he doesn't stretch his scepter towards me, I'm going to die. 
What was, what was, what was Mordecai's response? Who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Mordecai put it in terms that he saw. Listen, I believe the hand of God is in, is in this. And I believe that you have been placed in this position just for this time. Push yourself aside. You're not going to escape if you don't speak up just because you're in the king's house. Haman's going to get you too. So she offered no further objections, but she acted decisively. She acted decisively. Has there ever been a time that God put you in a position to do something for him? That he had orchestrated the moment in just this time for you? What did you do? Did you have the courage to go on and do what the Lord wanted you to do? Or did you go on and not fulfill what God had placed on your heart? Can you imagine how God feels when his people seems, sees an opportunity to do something for him and to do his will in the moment that it is needed and we don't? How do you think he feels when we do? God, it's quiet today, and this thing's driving me nuts. I keep thinking I need to swat something away from my face. So understand that there's a lot of times that God orchestrates situations so that we can be used of him in just that moment. This is the same incident here with Queen Esther, she was placed in this position from the moment that Vestai said that the Vestai was kicked out. I don't know what he did with her for sure. I, I, I can't remember. I know he, I can't remember. But since Vestai was out, that set the tone for Esther to become queen. I believe God had his hand in that from the very moment. From the very moment. All right. What did she say? She said, go and tell everyone to fast three days. Don't eat anything day and night. And after the three days, I will go to the king without invitation. And what was one of her final statements? If I perish, I perish. Her statement should be viewed as courageous. Courageous words, words modeled after courageous actions. After courageous actions. Is it, it's not enough for us to say what we believe. It's not enough. It must be seen in our actions. It must be seen in our actions. At, at work, I don't take lunch. I have two little breaks. That way I'm out of there at 1 p.m. I go in at 5 and I'm out at 1 like a, like a bullet. I was sitting in there taking a break, and this guy come in to sit down. We was all talking. And, and he put us all, got us all his lunch together. And, and we was talking and joking. And I think we was talking about a football game. I don't know. And uh, he bowed his head to pray, and I, and I was talking, and I shut up. And everybody kind of looked around. And I nodded my head at him. And he raised his and he looked around and said, Oh, I'm sorry. I said, No, don't be sorry. We're sorry for talking over you. He could have very well just sit down and start eating. He didn't have to pray. Six courageous actions sometimes. We need to not just say what we believe, but it needs to be seen in every action that we take. In every action that we take. All right. Because of, Mor because of Morde Mordecai's confidence in divine providence, in divine providence, and Esther's courage by the conclusion of the book, not only the book of Esther, not only were the Jews saved, and not only was Haman dead, but Mordecai had taken Haman's office. 
and the Jewish enemies had been vanquished. Finally had been vanquished. All because of confidence in God and one person's courage. Don't tell me that you can't do something for the Lord. I'm talking to the Bible class today. We might be a little bit older than the other classes, but God's not done with us yet. We can still do something for the Lord. There's no reason, and we have no past to sit back and prop our feet up and say, well, I've made it to my golden years. It's time to just slide. No, it's not. Oh, it's a time like never before for us to work. It's a time for us never before to put our shoulder to the wheel and to join in the work of the Lord. Find our place and be a doer, not just a speaker. Let this world see, man. That, that, that David Lucas, that old guy, he just keeps going. Not that because I'm, old, I'm, I'm older than you guys. But we cannot give up yet because we haven't reached our goal yet. My goal's heaven. Is that yours? My goal's heaven, and I want to see to the end. I don't want there to be any, any question about where I want to go. I want to make sure that I am doing all that I can for the Lord. All right, all right. Turn this page here. I get crazy, and I add pages to my stuff. I'm having to keep an eye on the time because I think I'm running late. Now, throughout, the, th throughout this book of Esther, there's no mention God's not mentioned. The word God is absent from the book of Esther. But his direction, his protection, and his deliverance are not absent. He did not abandon his people or his promises. The book of Esther is shot through with faith that God is directing human affairs. Even in the pagan court of Persia, Mordecai's famous question is more than anything else a statement of this faith in God's old God is in ultimate control over human affairs and events uh, Barry Webb said in uh, five festivals uh, five festival garments God is present even when he is most absent when there is no miracles dreams Visions, charismatic leaders, no prophets to interpret what's happening. He is still present as a deliverer. He's still present as a deliverer. Whereas the exodus of, God's de of God delivering the, e the Israelites out of Egypt was full of miracles where Esther's was not. God chose to work behind the scenes in the book of Esther, as it were, to accomplish his will and to protect his people. The classic example of divine providence, as a classic example of divine providence. I am sorry, man, my, I cannot speak today. We serve a God who not only can shake mountains and dry up oceans but he can also equally affect and can direct political appointments and thwart evil government plots when you think about how esther became queen and all that happened along the way up and t up and to the possibility of losing her own life and those of the jews we see how being obedient and following the right thing may not be easy, but it comes out for the best. I'll tell you a story. What time is it? On the front porch of a little country store in Illinois, the owner of a small business stood with his partner. Business was going bad. And his partner asked, how long can we keep this going? The owner answered, it looks as if our business has just about washed out. He, con he concluded, he con I'm sorry, he continued, 
you know, it wouldn't be so bad if I could just do what I want to do. I want to study law. I wouldn't mind so much if we could sell everything, we could pay off all the bills, and I could buy a book. The one book that I'd want to buy is Blackstone's Commentary on English Law. But I guess I can't. At that moment, the story goes on that a strange-looking wagon comes down the road and pulls up in front of the porch of the old store. The driver is all haggard and tired. And he looks at the store owner and says, I'm trying to move my family out west. I'm out of money. I've got a good barrel here that I'd sell for 50 cents. The businessman's eyes went along the wagon and came to the wife. She was looking at him very, very pleadily, and her face was thin and emaciated. He slipped his hand into his pocket and took out, according to him, his last 50 cents that he had. And he said, well, I reckon I could use a good bar barrel. Pays the man 50 cents and takes the barrel. All day long, the barrel sat on the front porch of the store. His partner kept teasing him about that barrel and his last 50 cents. It was late in the evening. The businessman walked out and looked down into the barrel, and he saw something in the bottom of it, papers that he hadn't noticed before. He bought it in the daytime. That's me. He is bought it big time. So with his long arm, he reached down into the barrel, and he fumbled around, and he hit something solid. And he pulled out a book and stood dumbfounded. It was Blackstone's commentary on English law. On English law. The businessman could have told uh, the guy in the wagon, I can't help you. And the thing that he wanted the most would have went down the road and escaped him. But because he took an opportunity to help someone else out in a tough spot, he was blessed. You know who that businessman was? Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln. Would it have been wrong if Mr. Lincoln to say, I just can't help you. Some people would say, no, that would have been no problem. And maybe it wouldn't have. But sometimes doing right isn't easy, and you may not see the end result right away. If he hadn't bought the barrel, maybe he wouldn't have become an attorney. And maybe he wouldn't have become president of the United States. You don't realize what small act of kindness that you do for someone else turns into something great later. Yes, there are times that we must have courage to do that which is right. We've got to stand in front of people that we know and in front of people that will make fun of us, and sometimes we just got to do what's right. We've got to stand up for the Word of God no matter what the rest of the world says. I don't care what the world says. I don't particularly care what anyone thinks if I'm standing on righteousness and I'm doing the right thing. The, we, as the seniors of this Bible church, must stand for what's right. When young people see us, they should say, the, I'm going to tell you what, our elders are doing what's right. They don't, they, they don't just sit and not worship. They worship even when we don't. I thought it was on. We're going to do what's right no matter what. Because we have experiences. We have things that have happened in our life that has assured us that there is a God that's willing to step in in any circumstance. In any circumstance. In the book of Esther, is part of the book of Esther is part of a, 
the divinely intended design. In other words, God purposely stepped into the shadows and removed himself from plain view. Why? If we take God's absence as intentional, what do you see in the story of Mordecai and Esther? What you see is courage. It's courage. What you see is courage. In the face of almost certain death, Esther declared her intention to at least attempt to save her people. The possibility of good in saving her people was worth her own life. I want to ask you, what is worth the salvation of the people you know in your life that are going to be lost? What is it? Are you going to have the courage to say, listen, it's time that you made your election sure. It's time that you sought God. It's time that you made a decision to live for God. Do you not see what's happening in this world today? Things are happening. Things are being put into motion. God could come at any time. And you, you need to stand for what's right. You need the Holy Ghost. Let's just call it what it is. This world needs the salvation power of the Holy Ghost speaking with other tongues as the Spirit gives utterance. There's no other There's no other answer. Even if God doesn't come back for a while, there's going to be things that come upon this world that we must be ready for, that we must have something that will carry us through, and that's going to be the Holy Ghost. That's going to be the Spirit of God. That's going to be the Word that is planted in our hearts. Hallelujah. Lord, where am I at? In many ways, courage is just faith at ground level. I wish I could have come up with that one my own, but it was written. <laughs> faith is courage at ground level. Trusting in God requires bravery. But, but people make fun of me. Be brave. Stick it out. Let me ask you you live for God, where are you going to be in a hundred years from now? But if you don't live for God, where are you going to be in a hundred years from now? You're going to be in heaven or you're going to be in hell. Which one would you rather have? If you say hell, there's something the matter with you. We all need to get around you and cast some things out. Well, you see, being brave and standing and saying, I want my calling an election sure I want to go to heaven let them make fun of you because I'm going to tell you I'm running out of time <laughs> I'm going to tell you that they're going to wish that they were in heaven if they don't make it and seeing you there ain't going to do nothing for them but you seeing them there is going to do something for you oh only if I would have stepped out when I had the chance be brave Trust in God and understand this right here. And, ah, uh, man, I'm going to have to end it with this. It is not enough to say we trust God if we are unwilling to take risks for Him. If we are unwilling to take risks for Him, what is our faith? Where is our courage if we are unwilling to take risks? Let's pray. Hallelujah.